守低问，何时何方可让？回音轻传，此时此处似模样。何须多见，复多求？且唱一曲归途上。此时此处，此模样，此模样。Hong Kong is a small city with a population of seven million people. We have no natural resources, but we are blessed with a rich endowment of human capital. Our talents come from all walks of life, and they share a common goal to create a bright future for the city. As our local scientists venture into uncharted territories, their cutting-edge technological innovations are able to make improvements to our daily lives. In this episode, we will see how these innovations are closely connected to our daily lives. On 16th of July 1969, the American astronaut Neil Armstrong rode on Apollo 11 and became the first man to land on the moon. I'm sure you remember his quote: "That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind." What he said has inspired many scientists to believe that even very small things can lead to big discoveries for mankind. In this episode, we can see how some local scientists develop new technologies that make a difference to our daily lives. Let's celebrate Creative Hong Kong. You may very often come across the term nano, but do you know what it is? Let's hear what they have to say. Well, from what I saw on TV, it's、uh, something that can clean lots of things. A unit smaller than a number, something you can't see with the naked eye. Anything called nano seems amazing. Well, of course, a nanometer is incredible in chemistry because it gives the structure of matter. The particles in the structure are special characteristics, so it's really. Something that's really incredible, actually. You know, I came across this word nano at school. I think about 30 odd years ago. I can't remember exactly what it is, but I think it's、um, to do with atoms, molecules. The size of it is about times 10 to the power of minus nine. So, what is it used for? My guess is、um, we've heard of washing liquid. Um, use nanotechnology. So I think it's some very small particles that you can use to make things that that makes it extra clean. Nanometer is not a material. It is a unit of measurement, just like centimeter and millimeter. If we rank them by length, starting from meter, the order will be meter, centimeter, millimeter, micrometer, and nanometer. For example, the human hair grows five nanometers per second. Therefore, following this ratio, our hair will have grown three millimeters in a week's time, and 1.8 centimeters in six weeks' time. Put in simple terms, a nanometer is a unit of measurement. This here is a kind of nanomaterial. This is carbon nanotube used to strengthen ballistic proof. Vest fabric made of ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene, and actually, what we're seeing here is a huge number of tiny little carbon nanotubes because they have a very large surface area. I arrived in Hong Kong in July of 1993. Before I arrived in Hong Kong, I got my PhD in chemical engineering from Cambridge, and did over three years of postdoctorate research on ultra-high molecular substances, studying this material. And that material is something known as UHMWPE. This UHMWPE is most famous for its application in ballistic-proof vest projects because it can create a remarkably strong and resilient material. And at that time, in 1980, a Dutch company by the name of DSM invented a solvent. And this solvent they invented could be used for spinning. But when used in ultra-high molecular substances, that solvent is toxic. So when used in engineering, the use of the solvent may not necessarily be a problem, but as a biological substance to be used for the body, it may be harmful to humans. So that's why I have an interest in studying this material. 
UHMWPE can be used not only in fabric for ballistic proofing, but also in the human body as biotechnology. Nowadays, many people suffer from heart problems, and when used as a stent material, it can be extremely thin, and it's resistant to wear and tear. So once the stent is inserted, it's moisturized and it will do very little damage to the human body. Another example of something we make is the UHMWPE membrane. So if a telephone suddenly fried, well, in that case, a person could be injured from that, right? So the key in this example is in the insulating material that's inside of the telephone. So when there is a partial short circuiting inside of the phone, the temperature can become high, causing a fire. But this material can prevent this from happening at all because it maintains its strength even after it melts. This is important, very important, because it ensures safety in our everyday lives outside of comfort. <laughs> We do engineering. This is chemical engineering. After all, our work isn't based on just basic scientific research. I would say that the key is having strong curiosity. And you must be interested in whatever it is that you want to do. We spent decades on this material. Now, as I just explained to you about this material, this UHMWPE, it can be widely applied in many, many areas. It can be an insulating material for batteries. It can be used in ballistic proof vests. And it can be used to make various materials as well. So, as you can tell, this material can be very useful. Nanomaterials have quite a large surface area, but are quite small in dimension, making them suitable for lots of applications. I didn't know what I wanted to be back then. So I decided to choose subjects that I like studying. So that was chemistry and physics. Um, that's what material science is about. Um, plus it's also, it wasn't a popular subject to study, so it was easier for me to get in. In real life, I don't think I can apply what I studied onto anything, but it's interesting. Like sometimes when I go to buy a car, um, they tell me, okay, this is an alloy wheel, that's carbon fiber. I knew what, it, what those things are, and you can guess the reason why they chose these materials. Pen and ink means studying or doing research. Although there were some obstacles along the way for me, from high school to university, I received a relatively good education. However, during the Cultural Revolution, our studies were suspended and we were sent off to farms and factories to work. We didn't ask to be sent, we were just sent there. Late after the reform, I had the chance to go and study in the UK. I can tell you this, I was the first Chinese person to get a PhD from Cambridge after 1949. Before I came here to Hong Kong, I was teaching classes at Manchester University in the UK from 1991 until 1995. In 1995, I became a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Science and Technology and taught there until I retired. My specialty is in the field of applied mechanics with a concentration on impact dynamics. My concentration, impact dynamics, is applied all over the world, including the US and Europe. It's related to the defense industry. But of course, with Hong Kong, we won't consider topics related to national defense and the military, but instead topics that are related to things like society and personal security. So, after coming here, I have, just as an example, assessed various kinds of safety helmets used on construction sites. And later, after that, the Hong Kong police came to us to assess if the riot helmets they'd imported from Canada, France and other places were safe for them to use, for themselves, were they safe to use in Hong Kong. These are impact-related safety issues. Also, ballistic-proof vests came in from this angle. They're needed for security purposes. Civilian safety and civilian protection in society. Um, these are some of the safety issues that I'm personally very concerned about. My speciality is applied mechanics. Professor Gao's is chemical engineering specializing in the research and manufacturing of ultra-high molecular material. When these two areas merge and come together, 
There are many new ideas that come from it. Decades ago, there was a new material that was discovered. It's called a carbon nanotube. It has very good properties. And we very much hope to be able to combine the strengths of carbon nanotubes with ultra-high molecular material to make something new with very good impact resistance properties, a new kind of material that can be further developed to be applied to ballistic proof vests and other impact resistant applications. But this technology presents great difficulty because carbon nanotubes are extremely small things. It isn't some kind of a powder substance that you might imagine would gather together easily, so it isn't an easy task to distribute the carbon nanotubes all over the material. But due to her deep understanding of this material's property, she could, also with the ultra-high molecular material, she has this deep understanding of its transformative mechanism that I don't have. So that's why we were able to do well on this topic and, as a result, receive an international patent for it and recognition from international companies. The key is her understanding of ultra-high molecular materials. Hong Kong's real weakness lies in the single source of funding. There's only the government RGC we can apply for. Then we worked with the rest of the industrial world. And then, after that, we applied for funding from ITC. Generally, compared to other countries, there are very few um, sources of funding for us here. And most projects that are funded are small, on a smaller scale. Unlike the US, which has some larger topics, or Europe, and later the EU, which collaborated on larger topics and has the need for larger labs and equipment. In Hong Kong, we're limited in such aspects. I think Hong Kong should offer support in both areas, especially the latter, which will bring certain economic benefits and bring about new companies and create new job opportunities. I think Hong Kong should invest more resources in supporting these projects, as it would improve the people's life quality and increase the support for the kind of technology that we all come across in our everyday lives. Hong Kong is a very liberal and free place. As, as long as what you do is within the law, uh, you can do anything you like. And I think the attitude of the people is also very important. Here, um, if, if you do anything daring or new, you wouldn't be frowned upon by, by the people here. So I think it's the receptiveness to new things that, uh, that's the key uh, success factor of Hong Kong. I want to invent a robot. Maybe an anywhere door. Well, I would like to invent something that would help protect the environment. I want to invent like a, a spaceship to fly through the universe. Well, I think for everyone, it's a kind of a learning process. We continue learning throughout our lives. We don't just stay stagnant just because we've become teachers or professors. So whether we're young people or middle-aged people, all of us are always learning. Every scientific study is difficult. That's just a fact. And you know if it weren't difficult, you wouldn't be doing it. If that were the case, someone else would have already done it. But don't be afraid of failure. Keep trying until you find the best solution. And whenever we do scientific research, the best thing is to expand our knowledge. The very best way to work is with scientists from other areas. Each person's knowledge is limited. But through interdisciplinary collaboration, we can learn from each other and overcome the boundaries between the disciplines and create chemistry and achieve new accomplishments in our respective disciplines. And combine our strengths, just like how we make composites, to create better, newer things. Well, I have already retired, so though I may be helping out at the university, any new ideas on scientific research are Professor Gao and her team's work to achieve. But Professor Gao has been talking to me lately about some of the ideas she's had to combine graphene with ultra-high molecular materials to achieve certain properties.
and she's already done some very good preliminary work with her students. In 2011, the Labor and Welfare Bureau spent $1.3 billion to renovate around 3,500 barrier-free facilities in the 18 districts. Although we have now made it more convenient for the disabled to get around, some places still do not have adequate barrier-free facilities. This wheelchair can actually climb up stairs according to the different angles of different stairs. There's other climbing equipment out there, but it can climb stairs of a certain angle only. It can't always be used. And all stairs seem to have the same angle, but actually they're all different. Because this one can adjust itself to climb stairs of different angles, the disabled or physically challenged can manage most stairs. After graduating high school, I took a job illustrating the covers for toy products. Usually when drawing covers, someone hands you a toy, and then you'll design it from there. One time, I designed a toy that's very hard to manufacture. And actually, I was told that it frankly couldn't be done. So what should I do? It was my design. So I designed the machine to produce it, and it evolved. Actually, I could design anything, and that's why I like to refer to myself as an anything designer. In May 2011, I saw an RTHK program called A Mission for Equal Opportunities. It was the story of a young man who was paralyzed from the waist down due to a work injury, and so he was confined to a wheelchair. The building that he lived in happened to have some stairs, so every time that he wanted to go out, he needed the help of several people to get him up those stairs. Over time, he just found it to be simply too troublesome, and so he stopped going out and became socially withdrawn. I couldn't help but think, it's only some stairs. How difficult can it really be? And how can I help this youth? So I started to work on a design for a wheelchair that could help people like that. In the past, my design was simple. Once the design was done, then my work would be finished after that. But now that I'm doing more like scientific research, things are different. I need to be invested in every step, from the design and the drawing of it to the final production. There's a lot more I need to oversee. When I was just a designer, I only thought if my design would sell. Now that's not enough. Now I have to consider the feelings of the customer. When I first designed this wheelchair, wow, cool, it looks nice. That's all I thought, but that's not enough. Would the user like this chair? I must consider this and think more about these things when doing scientific research. I'm a big fan of Hong Kong product design. I always go to um, the design gallery of uh, Hong Kong TDC um, to look for new things. Uh, it's not high-tech stuff, but it's really um, how present technology is applied uh, to come up with you know, new design, new gadgets. Um, so I think that's the, really the, um, the forte of Hong Kong. A couple of years ago, I was catching up with Alan on the roof of my home when he told me that there were already companies that gave him an eight-figure offer to buy the patent for his invention. However, he was unwilling to sell the patent to them because there's a difficult story behind every person who has to use a wheelchair to get themselves around, he said. And he said that, as an inventor, if he sold the patent and the company that bought it were to skimp on the job or use inferior materials to construct it, the user might suffer a bad experience through the use of his invention, and he just wasn't willing to let that happen. I was very touched by that. It left a deep impression, and I admire and respect him a lot for it. Well, in the past, I would simply design everything just based on my boss's demands and the requirements that I was given. I didn't do any research, and I didn't ask what the user needed before designing. I just didn't see the need to do that. But now it's different. Now I must pay strict attention to every detail and design based on the requirements of the handicapped. Actually, I lost one-fourth of the upper right portion of my right eye. I've lost just a fourth of my vision and feel the inconvenience. Imagine if you 
lost a whole eye, or both your eyes, or one of your arms, or the use of your legs, that'd be so much more limiting and inconvenient. I put myself in their shoes and see what help they need, because if I can design something to help them, I'll feel very happy. I hope this wheelchair can help its user live a better obstacle-free life, because that's why I designed it. In Hong Kong today, people seem to have a very low happiness index sometimes, don't you think? But if you try to have interactions a bit more with, well, with people in wheelchairs, for example, then you'll realize how positive and optimistic they are. If you interact with them more, you won't complain so much. You'll learn how to face life in a more positive way. I think the physical mobility of handicapped people is the most important thing we need to care about. It's really a basic human right. It's not only handicapped people, but um, the elderly too. My mother can't walk very well, so she needs a lot of carers uh, to look after her daily life. So I think mobility is the most important thing. The main thing is funding. <laughs> it's most important. Neighboring countries do tend to have more investment in scientific research, and actually scientific research often needs various uh, forms of support. We have an abundance around us with mainland China and Taiwan who can both offer a supply of machinery or electronic hardware. Scientific research means spending money. I need to hire people to, to do the drawings and other things too, and they're all really costly things. My goal now is to perfect the wheelchair, which I'm working on. And after that, I have an idea to help people who are blind. After that, I hope I'll have no more ideas so I can rest and just be happy. Because if I get another idea, then I'll have no choice but to push it forward. However, I feel, uh, well, I feel much happier now because I'm doing something I wasn't even able to pursue or accomplish before. It may be more difficult, and sure, it is a lot of hard work, but I've also gained things that I never imagined before. On October the 15th, 2003, Chinese astronaut Yang Li Wei took the Shenzhou 5 to go into space. He quoted the saying, opportunity comes to those who are prepared. Scientists uphold their beliefs and work very hard to research and develop new technologies to make the world a better place. Like them, we should all persist in our quest for knowledge and innovation. See you next time on Creative Hong Kong.